During the bubble era, I saw many people get caught up and overwhelmed by money. Even now, as a shareholder earning $100,000 a year in dividends, I'm not sure I fully understand how to manage money. When my son's wife, who mistook me for a poor person living on my savings and looked down on me and said that we were cut off, finally found out the truth. My name is Mary. I'm 68 years old and living off my savings. I lost my husband in an accident when I was 33. And since then, I've raised my son, David, all on my own. David is now independent, has his own family and two kids, so I'm a grandmother of two. But the truth is, while I seem to be living off my savings, I'm actually a shareholder receiving an annual dividend of $100,000. Very few people know about this. Over 30 years ago, the country was swept up in the excitement of the economic bubble. I was living modestly in a New York apartment with my husband and our son David, who had just started elementary school. It was close to downtown, but still had that old town charm, though it was starting to get crowded. The older buildings around us were being torn down and new ones were being built. My husband's company was doing well and his salary and bonuses were generous. Most people at the time were caught up in the bubble, believing that the bright future would go on forever. It was a time when girls with just a high school diploma carried designer bags, took taxis for transportation, and people with a little money bought stocks, while those with more money bought and sold land or buildings. Both my husband and I were practical types, so we saved money with David's future in mind and didn't spend recklessly. Still, we did indulge in the occasional luxury family vacation. The only thing we did during the bubble economy was my husband bought an expensive life insurance policy following the advice of an insurance salesperson. My husband was only 36 and in good health, so I was against taking out a $1 million life insurance policy. But since David was still young, we were advised it would be wise to have it just in case, and we ended up signing up for it. Signing up for the insurance didn't change anything in our lives. We continued living happily as a close-knit family, content with our ordinary happiness. But less than a year later, something completely unexpected happened. My husband was killed in a car accident. The other driver was the son of a wealthy family, and they offered a large settlement for damages. Between the insurance payout and the settlement, I suddenly found myself a wealthy widow. The money brought me no happiness. I was devastated by the loss of my husband, and if giving up all the money would have brought him back, I would have done it without a second thought. I truly loved my husband, who was always so cheerful and kind-hearted. In the depths of my grief, I couldn't believe the words my relatives were saying at my husband's funeral. I'm so sorry for your loss, but you must have gotten a lot of money, right? You really signed up for that insurance just in time. I've got a great property deal. Could you lend me some money? Some even tried to sell me things. I think everyone had gone a little crazy because of the bubble economy. After that, I started distancing myself from my relatives. Still, as time passed and the pain began to ease, I felt grateful that David and I had enough money to live on. Back then, just keeping money in the bank earned enough interest to cover our living expenses. I never had any interest in designer goods or fancy food and I couldn't bear to waste the money I had gained in exchange for my husband's life. 
so I took a part-time job at a local grocery store. Even working just a few hours while David was at school provided us with a comfortable life, and I'm sure some people envied that. Meanwhile, the bubble era was coming to an end. I was 36, and David had just started middle school. The economy suddenly tanked, and companies were going bankrupt one after another. I remember thinking, what was all that excitement for? It made me realize how money can drive people crazy. Even my relatives probably wouldn't have acted like that if it weren't for the bubble. At that time, the interest rate at the bank was 5%. That's why I could live off the interest alone. But I knew that interest rates were only going to keep dropping from there. It was around that time that I met Scott, who worked at a brokerage firm. He was 34, two years younger than me. He was one of those affected by the bubble economy. He deeply regretted that many of his clients had gone bankrupt because of him. Some of them had even been torn apart as families. The only saving grace is that no one has taken their own life he told me that several of his colleagues had witnessed such tragedies. So I made a request to him. I want to invest in companies that stayed steady during the bubble and those that have been working hard all along. Perhaps because Scott felt he had something to atone for, he gladly accepted my request and I became a shareholder in several companies. In the end, this turned out to be a success. While there were no sudden price surges, the company steadily grew, and I became a shareholder receiving $100,000 in annual dividends. I kept the fact that we had money and that my investments had been successful hidden from David. Part of me believed that money could drive people crazy, and I didn't think knowing about the money would benefit David's future. All we have is a little bit of money that your dad left us. That's what I told David. When David turned 30, he told me he wanted to get married and introduced me to his fiancée. She was a beautiful young woman from his company, three years younger than him, named Natalie. At the time, David and I were still living in the old New York apartment where we had lived with my late husband. It had been scheduled for demolition during the bubble, but when the bubble burst, those plans were abandoned and the apartment remained. I figured that when David got married, we would arrange for him to get a new place, and whether they lived with me or not, we'd deal with it then. Besides, I had a deep attachment to the apartment where I had lived with my husband. In Natalie's eyes, though, it must have looked like a poor, single-parent home. She glanced around my apartment, not bothering to hide her disdain, and said, It's going to be hard for the three of us to live here, don't you think? I thought so, too, so I nodded silently. Mom. Natalie and I thought we'd like to live on our own until we have kids. We're planning to rent an apartment nearby. It seemed David was already under Natalie's thumb. In short, Natalie didn't want to live with me. I suppose that's understandable. Well, about living expenses. Until then, David had given me $1,500 out of his salary. $2,500 every month. In reality, I'd been depositing all of it into a savings account in his name. That's not a problem. Your dad left us some money, and I'm also working part-time, so I'll be fine. David looked relieved when I said that. Up until then, I didn't have much of a bad impression of Natalie, but while David was in the bathroom, she said something that shocked me. You're from the bubble generation, right? It's such a shame to live like this when you were born in a time when it was so easy to make money. If it were me, 
I definitely would have ended up rich. The way she said it, clearly looking down on me, left me with a terrible impression of her. It's easy to say things in hindsight. A lot of people got swept up in the bubble, myself included. Looking back, it might seem like everyone acted foolishly, but when you're in the middle of it, it's not always that simple. Aren't your savings running low? Well, good luck, but don't count on us for anything. Actually, I get $100,000 a year in dividends from my stocks, and my savings exceed $3 million. She said it so condescendingly that I almost considered telling her the truth, but I held back. Yes, that's true. Please take care of David for me. David has his own life to live. If he ever really needs help, I'll be there for him. That's how I decided to approach it. So I never revealed my secret to David or Natalie. Still, I quietly handed David the savings account statement containing the money he had been giving me for the household. Make sure Natalie doesn't find out. Use it if you ever need it. The savings exceeded $100,000. David seemed quite surprised. That's the money you've been giving me over the past eight years since you started working. Remember when I told you we had a little left from your dad? That's why I never needed help with living expenses. But I didn't tell you this earlier because I didn't think it would be good for you. Money is important but it can also drive people crazy. Use it wisely. David nodded deeply at my words. Eight years have passed since David got married. I'm still working part-time, just a few hours a day. It's a valuable way to stay connected with society. When I'm not working, I spend my days watching movies on a large monitor I've set up in my apartment or visiting art galleries and museums, and I've been enjoying life in my own way. I now have two grandchildren, a six-year-old grandson and a four-year-old granddaughter. Grandchildren really are adorable. David occasionally brought them to my apartment, but his wife, Natalie, never came along. One day though, Natalie came with them which was unusual. When she saw how attached my grandchildren were to me, she snapped. I knew it. You've been bringing the kids here all the time, haven't you? Well, not all the time. It's just that you don't want mom to come to our place. And mom wants to see her grandkids, right? Apparently, David had been bringing the kids without telling Natalie. I'm sorry. It's my fault. I told him I wanted to see my grandchildren. When I said that, trying to defend David, Natalie yelled hysterically. I don't want some poor old lady living off her savings telling me what to do. You don't have any money, so just keep quiet. I'll never take care of you, and I'm totally fine with cutting ties. At that point, I couldn't just stay quiet. Natalie. Don't say something you'll regret later. I won't regret it. That's it. You're never seeing my kids again. With that, she grabbed the kids by the hand and started to leave. Even David seemed shocked. Hey, what are you saying? Wait a minute. Mom, I'm sorry. Let me handle this. He hurried after Natalie and kids. I let out a sigh. Even after eight years of marriage, I had only seen Natalie a handful of times. From the beginning, she treated me like a burden. It's normal for mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law not to get along. Natalie had said that before, but if she never intended to get along from the start, there's nothing I can do about it. About two months later, David came to my apartment after work. He looked pale, and it was clear that something serious had happened. Sorry, Mom. 
Natalie found out about the savings account you gave me. Honestly, I was more surprised he had managed to hide it from her for so long. After eight years of his marriage, I couldn't believe he had kept it from Natalie all this time. From what he told me, David's life sounded pretty miserable. When they first got married, he had a monthly allowance of $300, but after their first child was born, it was reduced to $200, and when their second child was born, it dropped to $150. That's tough, especially when it includes lunch money. Meanwhile, Natalie had been spending freely on makeup, clothes, and fancy lunches, all while forcing David to scrimp. So I've been dipping into the savings a little each month. For things like going out with coworkers sometimes, or buying socks when mine had holes because she wouldn't buy me new ones. Hearing this made me want to cry for David. It turns out he had kept a withdrawal receipt in his wallet, and Natalie found it. Hey, what's this receipt? Why does the account have nearly $100,000 in it? She confronted him, and David admitted that it was money I had given him from what his dad had left behind. That wasn't entirely true, but it didn't matter. She took the entire account. She's already withdrawn about $20,000. I'm just so exhausted. According to David, having that savings account is what helped him endure a lot of things. From Natalie's daily complaints, constant gossiping, to calming her down during her hysterical outbursts, it was all because of that savings account that he managed to cope. I advised David to report the debit card as lost so that she couldn't take any more money from the account. If you report it lost and get a new one issued, you won't have to worry about Natalie withdrawing any more money. Call the bank as soon as you can. Right. I guess I was in shock and just couldn't think straight. David is easygoing by nature, but at times he can be a little too laid back. The other day, she said some terrible things to you, didn't she? The moment I try to defend you, she starts yelling. You're such a mama's boy and has a meltdown. Things seemed even more serious than I had realized. Recently, it seems like she started saying awful things to the kids when I'm not around. That was something I couldn't ignore. Think carefully about what's best for you and your kids. I can take care of you and the two grandchildren if it comes to that. It was all I could say. I didn't want to force a divorce on him, and I believe that matters between a husband and wife should be resolved between them. If you ever find yourself with nowhere to go, you're always welcome here. David nodded several times when I said that. A month later, I found myself on the open sea. A 30-day luxury cruise around the coast of the U.S. David and my two grandkids are with me. It was 30 days of relaxation, far from the stresses of everyday life. With all the amenities on board, there wasn't a moment to feel bored. Then I got a call from Natalie. I could have ignored it, but I decided to answer. Mary, where are you? I went to the salon, and when I came home, David was gone. He left a divorce agreement and took our kids with him. He's been gone since yesterday, and when I went to your apartment, it was gone too. David's here with me. I switched to a video call and showed her the vast blue ocean and the luxurious interior of the cruise ship. What? I'm on a luxury cruise with my two grandchildren. We're about to have a lovely French dinner, so I'll have to go. Wait, what are you talking about? Explain this to me. I ignored Natalie's shouting and hung up the phone. During dinner, she kept calling me over and over again. 
After savoring the delicious French meal, I finally answered the phone. Finally, you pick up. What's going on? That apartment? I've decided to rebuild it into a condo. Since construction is starting soon, I thought I'd take a relaxing trip in the meantime. David had some vacation days saved up, so he's here with me. What? I don't understand what you're saying. It's none of your concern, since you cut ties with me, but I'm actually a shareholder earning $100,000 a year in dividends. Sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not a poor old lady living off my savings. Hold on, Mary. You've cut ties with me. David says he's getting a divorce, so we'll talk when I get back. We'll be staying at a hotel until the condo is built, so I'll be in touch. Natalie was still shouting something on the other end, but I didn't bother listening and hung up the phone. A lot happened over the past month. First, Natalie realized she couldn't withdraw money and threw a fit, claiming the savings were shared marital assets. Marital assets refer to things built together after marriage. Even though David explained that this didn't apply, she refused to accept it. If you want to talk about shared assets, how about the $500 a month you've been spending on clothes and makeup since we got married? What's wrong with a wife wanting to look good? When David pushed back, Natalie got even more upset. Looking utterly exhausted, David came to see me. I'm thinking of getting a divorce. He said quietly. I think that's a good idea. As for where you'll live, I'm planning to rebuild this apartment into new condo. Or maybe we should buy a nice high-rise condo? At first, David thought I was joking when I said that. What are you talking about, Mom? The truth is, after the bubble burst, I bought this land and building at a significant discount. The building was already old at the time, but I continued to live there. It was because the apartment was filled with memories of my late husband. And so, I finally revealed the secret I had been keeping from David all these years. To be honest, I still don't know if it was the right thing to do. Back then, I didn't know what else to do. I couldn't bring myself to spend the money I received in exchange for your dad's life frivolously. As for Natalie, maybe things would have turned out differently if I had told you we had money from the start. No, I think it was for the best. You didn't spoil me, but I never felt miserable either. I had a perfectly normal school life. If I had known we had money, I probably would have gone off track. I'm not that smart. I didn't believe that, but maybe that's just me being a doting parent. And as for Natalie, I think it was good to keep it hidden. If she'd only been nice because we had money, or cut ties because we didn't, who would want a wife like that? David said this with a hint of sadness. After sharing the truth with David, I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. David said that if we were rebuilding, he'd prefer to live here rather than in a high-rise condo. He doesn't like heights. That was what I wanted as well. So I quickly contacted a construction company. It's not a large plot of land so we can only build a small, cozy condo. But I was happy to stay in the neighborhood where I've lived for so long. On the appointed day, Natalie arrived at the suite of the luxury hotel we were staying in, looking unusually subdued. David, my grandkids, and I had just returned from our cruise, and we decided to live in this upscale hotel in the city until the condo was ready. I had never relied on the fact that I had money and had lived modestly until now. The luxury cruise 
and this high-end hotel were my first real indulgences. I figured we deserved it. I spent my days taking the grandkids to zoos and aquariums, and sometimes hiring a sitter to have some time to relax. David commuted to work from the hotel, saying it felt strange. You really are rich, Mary. Natalie was quiet, as if she were a different person, watching our faces. We've already cut ties, so there's no reason for you to be here. What do you want? When I said that, Natalie, in a strangely sweet voice, began pleading. Come on, don't say that. I know I wasn't the best wife, but I'm going to change from now on. I doubt you'll change. Either way, I don't plan on staying married to you. David said firmly. Oh my God, my kids need their mom. Natalie tried to call the kids over to her, but our six-year-old grandson froze her with, I don't like you, Mommy. You're scary. I like Grandma better. What? Everyone's against me. I'm not getting divorced. I had expected her to say that. If that's the case, we'll proceed with lawyers. And when we do, you'll be returning all the money you took from David's savings. Natalie was at a loss for words when I said that. I'll spend whatever it takes to win both the divorce and custody. But if you sign the divorce papers now, I won't demand repayment of the money you took. I knew I sounded like a villain, but realizing she had no chance, Natalie slumped her shoulders and said, Okay. It's a cozy three-story building. The first floor has my apartment as the owner and David's apartment with his children. Even after learning about the money, David's life didn't change much. He still enjoys buying model kits, something he's loved since he was a kid, and spends his weekends building them. It seems to be his greatest joy. He also brought the models he couldn't take with him when he got married and now proudly displays them in his room, smiling as he looks at them. Isn't there anything else you'd like to do? You're one to talk, Mom. Instead of donating all the time, you should treat yourself to something nice once in a while. When I asked David, he laughed and said that to me. Money is important. It's definitely better to have it than not. But not everything fun or meaningful comes from money. He had a point. In the future, if the grandkids want to pursue something or follow a particular path, money won't be the reason they can't. When my parents needed care, I was able to provide for them, thanks to the help of my brother and his wife. Maybe that's enough. For a while after the divorce, Natalie would visit the kids on her designated days, but the visits gradually became less frequent and she began canceling more often. Apparently, she's been busy with dating. In the end, she's a selfish and cold person. She probably thinks she let a big fish slip away when it comes to David. She's probably frantically searching for the next man, thinking there might be someone even wealthier out there. It's a bit funny to imagine her meeting men, thinking they might be wealthy, and pretending to be a demure woman. But so far, I haven't heard a word about her remarrying. You've been through a lot, haven't you, Mary? Scott, my longtime friend from the brokerage firm, said this as we enjoyed lunch together. He's become quite successful, but has remained single all these years. I had a wonderful time on that luxury cruise. Next, I'm thinking of taking a trip around the world. Would you like to come with me? When I asked, Scott looked surprised. That sounds amazing. Are you sure I'd be welcome? Of course, 
Traveling alone can be lonely. Wait, not with your family, but just the two of us? David can't take that much time off, and his kids have school. Scott and I have known each other for 30 years. I've always sensed he had feelings for me, but I loved my late husband. And Scott, perhaps out of guilt for what happened to his clients during the bubble, seemed to reject the idea of pursuing happiness for himself, so he never made any moves. Thank you for looking out for me all these years. How about we grow old together from now on? For Scott, it might have felt like a proposal out of the blue. With money, I could live alone if I had to. But having a partner to grow old with would be so much better. Wait a minute. Let me propose to you properly myself later. Scott said this as he checked the size of my finger. I'm off to buy a ring now, so excuse me. With that, he rushed out in a hurry.